People sometimes misunderstand the Buddhist teachings on equanimity, thinking that it means a state where you don't really care about anything, you're indifferent, or that you have no preferences. That's equanimity of a, of a lazy person. Who has no goals in life. The Buddha, of course, has you take on a goal, the goal of freedom from suffering. And so he's teaching you the equanimity of a person who has a goal. Think of a warrior trying to win a battle. The, water has <coughs> the warrior has to be very stable, have an attitude of mind that's on an even keel. doesn't get upset by things, so that he or she can figure out the way out of a particular difficult situation. In other words, it's equanimity for the sake of victory. I may have told you the story about my older brother when he was first going to school. My grandfather, who didn't think much of the names my mother gave us. She tended to give us names that are a little bit too fancy for farm kids, in his mind. He was concerned that Galen would have people teasing him about his name. So he said, you've got to learn how to fight. Anybody teases you, you're going to punch him. And so he taught him a few moves. Grandpa had been a boxer, an amateur boxer, when he was younger. And as he they got going, he got a little bit more aggressive. And my older brother just lost it and started flailing, and that's when my grandfather put his hand on his head and says, stop, okay, you can't lose it. When somebody hits you, you've got to go cold, and then you hit them right in the face. And no, I don't think the Buddha would recommend people hitting people right in the face. The idea that when you are in a difficult situation, you have to go cold to see what needs to be done. That's something I think that he would approve of. He talks about equanimity as having three levels. There's ordinary, worldly equanimity, he calls it, which is equanimity with regard to sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. This is the kind of ordinary equanimity, say, that a soldier would have. But because we're going to be doing a lot more delicate work in dealing with bigger adversaries than just people outside, we're going to be dealing with our defilements, we need a deeper equanimity. That's what he calls equanimity. That's unworldly, or not of this world, or not of the flesh. And that's the equanimity of the fourth jhana, and on up. Then finally there's the equanimity that comes as a result of having attained awakening. The awakening itself is not equanimity, but when you reflect on your mind afterward, Seeing that it is now freed from greed, aversion, and delusion, you can either feel joy or rapture or equanimity. That kind of equanimity you don't create, it just happens. The other two you have to fabricate. And notice the first one covers not only everyday outside activities, it also has to co cover the first three jhanas. Because non-worldly equanimity doesn't kick in until the fourth, which means that as you're practicing to get the mind to settle down, you've got to depend on that kind of equanimity. So you can deal with difficult issues as they come up. When the Buddha taught breath meditation to Rahula, he taught him a whole series of contemplations, which are useful for developing that kind of equanimity. Because after all, these are preparations for a very proactive type of meditation. When the Buddha taught breath meditation, it wasn't simply just being with the breath, whatever. You were actually going to figure out what kind of what breathing would lead to rapture, what kind of breathing would lead to pleasure, how to breathe in a way that you're conscious of the whole body, how you can calm bodily fabrication, how you can breathe in a way that calms mental fabrication. 
Something that gladdens the mind, steadies the mind, releases the mind, provides a basis for insight to arise. That's a very proactive program. And as with any skill, you, you're going to be running into difficulties, so you're going to need the kind of equanimity that allows you to face them down and figure out what's going on from a calm, cool state of mind. So it's good to look at that series of contemplations that the Buddha gave to Rahula, because otherwise we simply say, well, try to get your mind calm and cool before you meditate, or work with your emotions as they come up. It doesn't give you much guidance. The Buddha gives you some things to think about. The first is that the body is made out of the four elements. So when you're afraid of the pain that'll come, or some people are afraid that they'll hurt their legs by meditating, you have to remind yourself the legs are just earth, water, wind, fire. The body's just these things. It's no big deal. It's nothing special. We tend to think that somehow our bodies are made out of some special stuff that's different from the rest of the world. But we have to remind ourselves, no, that's not the case. So this way we'll be more willing to, as John Lee would say, sacrifice our bodies for the sake of the practice. Then the Buddha gave Rahula some perceptions to hold in mind. To help him with equanimity, to so make your mind like earth, or water, or wind, or fire. As these things come into contact with disgusting things, they don't react. They just do their thing. You want to have a mind that's able to take pleasant and unpleasant sensations and be non-reactive. Again, not so that you just stop there being non-reactive, but so you can figure out what is the wisest thing to do. This also applies to any memories that come up, pleasant or unpleasant. So-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. There was this person, there was that person that you found attractive. Whatever the memories that come up, you have to remind yourself, I'm just making my mind like earth toward those memories. Make it like fire, burn them up, because they're not what's needed right now. There's also the contemplation of inconstancy, realizing that whatever it is that you might be planning or w wishing for in the future is going to go. There's only one thing that's not going to go. That would be unbinding. But everything else that you might aspire to is going to require a lot of work, and then when you get it, it's just going to start slipping through your fingers. This is to help you think about any distractions that may come up that would get in the way of staying with the breath. You remind yourself, this doesn't lead to anything permanent, not any worthwhile use of my time. So you can let it go. Then the Buddha gives the four Brahma Viharas, goodwill, anybody whose image comes up in your mind while you're meditating. If there's somebody who did something bad to you, okay, we'll have goodwill for them. Somebody in your family, goodwill. Dedicate the merit of your meditation to that person. If you see that they're suffering, okay, have some compassion. Again, thoughts of compassion made this person get out of that state. And someone who's already happy, someone already doing something skillful, can be happy for them. And then there are a lot of things that are just beyond your control. I think I've said other times that of the Brahma Viharas, that equanimity is the one that requires some discernment, so you can figure out okay, what things are beyond my control. The people I'd like to see happy, but they're not going to be happy. And this gets into another perception that the Buddha taught Rahula, which is the perception of not-self, realizing there are a lot of things in our range of awareness that we simply cannot control. And if we get worked up over them, then we're going to waste our energy. Because there are things where we can make a difference. So 
So you have to develop the insight they can see. Okay, what can I control? What can I not control? What do I have to put aside for the time being? What things will I be able maybe someday to pick up again, but not right now? And what things are just totally beyond me? And have some maturity around that. Don't take on the weight of the world. Take on the weights that you can handle. Because that way you actually will be able to make a lot of difference. If you take on too much, you bang your head against the wall and nothing happens as a result except for a broken head. So what the Buddha is doing here is giving you different ways of engaging in verbal fabrication and mental fabrication to induce a feeling of equanimity or a state of equanimity in the mind that enables you to fend off distractions, fend off different hindrances as they come up, and also puts the mind in a position where it can be a good judge of what's going on. Because as you settle down with the breath, there are days when you find the breath is very responsive, and other days when it's not. So you have to put the mind on an even keel to figure out okay, what's going wrong here, and what do I need to do in order to figure that out. And you have to be in a position where you're willing to put in a lot of time, if necessary. I had a friend who was studying pottery in Japan with a, one of those national living treasures, and she found herself getting upset. You know, every time she put her pots in the kiln, a lot of them would come out burnt or broken, whereas the national living treasure put pots in every day, and they come out perfect every day, every day. Until one day she came early to the pottery shed. And it turned out that his pots had burned the night before. But he wasn't upset. He was in the middle of the kiln trying to figure out what had happened. And she realized that was what she was missing, was that attitude of when things go wrong, not getting upset and just think, trying to figure out what's going wrong, what was the problem. So as we're meditating, we're trying to develop the equanimity of a craftsman. who wants the work to come out well, but realizes it's not going to come out well every time, and is willing to learn, and has the patience and the endurance and the restraint to be willing to learn. Because that's a lot of what equanimity is, it's restraint. You hold your mind in check, the thoughts that would run rampant. And go up and down the scales. You learn to keep them in check because they're not going to do you any good. You want to keep things on one single tone, because then you'll be in a better position to figure out what's gone wrong and what can be done to fix it. And of course, you don't want to bring these attitudes only to your meditation. They work best if you also practice them in daily life. So when people say unpleasant things or do unpleasant things, you can make your mind like earth. You can foster thoughts of goodwill for difficult people. You cannot get upset about the inconstancy of things because you realize this is a universal principle. It doesn't happen just to you. Then you can think about the things that are really beyond your control. So you can put them aside and not get, let the mind get worked up about them. So you want to be able to fabricate this kind of equanimity in daily life so it becomes easier and easier to fabricate it as you're settling down to meditate. To put yourself in a position where you really can deal with the breath in the most effective way. And even as the mind starts getting into states of jhana, as long as you're not in the fourth jhana, you're still going to be dealing with these, with this level of equanimity. And these contemplations will come in handy. 
some people when the mind settles down get really excited, and of course they lose it. The best attitude to take is just, oh, there's this. Let's watch it. Again, you hold the mind in check. You hold the mind. You exercise some restraint. Not by clamping down, but, but by having the right perceptions in mind to make it easier to keep the mind on an even keel. Because to get the mind to the deeper levels of equanimity requires that you be really observant. Once you get the mind into concentration, how do you stay with it? How do you be patient with it? So it's going to have a good effect on the mind. We're not jumping through jhana hoops here. You stay with it however long is required for the mind to settle in, gain a sense of nourishment from it, and be in a position where it can start observing. Okay, where, are there, where is there still stress here? What am I doing that's causing the stress? How can I stop that and, and not lose my concentration? That requires a very balanced, even keel kind of mind. So even though this is the lowest level of equanimity, it's the foundation for everything else. And try to develop the values to see equanimity as a good thing. Our culture doesn't place a very high value on it, but then again, look at our culture. We're trying to enter into the culture of the noble ones. And this is one of the qualities they say is worth developing, and you want to learn how to delight in developing it, see its value. It protects you from doing and saying and thinking a lot of things that you would later regret. And it puts you in a position where you can see things more clearly. So work on this kind of equanimity, both where you're sitting here and as you're going through daily life. And so that way that the peace of the higher levels will become possible.